Okay, welcome back to the veranda. Today, uh, or tonight actually, uh, late afternoon in Northwest Louisiana, we're gonna discuss 2A, so uh, week 2A, which will be chapter two of the textbook. I'm hopeful that you got through 1A lecture. As I said uh, last week, it's the longest single lecture we have. Hope you found it informative and a, a good snapshot, really, of the entire course not necessarily from the textbook, for, but from my uh, perspective and experience uh, in the field. So the chapter two is titled Leading Strategically. It's, again, a fairly basic chapter. There's some really good things in it, and I want to highlight those for you. Uh, if you go to slide two, four, remember I'm just going to refer to the four, five, six. Uh, we're going to take a look at, at what the, a vision and a mission statement is in a company and why they're used. We'll take a look at the acronym SMART Goals. Uh, we will take a look at uh, the balanced scorecard, uh, which is, as, as I mentioned, is the modern form of what we used to call management by objectives. We'll take a look at a relatively new notion of the triple bottom line, people, profit, planet. We'll take a look at, at uh, the CEO as a celebrity and how that can be good and bad. Um, and Probably the most important thing in the chapter is we'll take a look at five dimensions of an entrep entrepreneurial orientation inside of the established firm. Okay, so vision and mission statements. Those of you who have worked, you've probably seen one at your company. Probably can't remember what it is if you're being truthful. Uh, but a vision and mission statement, and later on in the end of the semester, I'm going to give you a little bit more detail on this. My approach that's worked for 30 years in consulting uh, is they they describe the firm's strategy framework. That's the phrase we we used from 1B last week. In very succinct terms that all of the stakeholders of a company can understand. Stakeholders being people, shareholders, other interest groups, joint ventures, uh, what have you. We don't necessarily want to publish our entire strategic framework to everybody, but we can uh, in annual uh, uh, reports for publicly traded companies, uh, communications to security analysts, uh, and even if you're in the, the private family firm, uh, vision, mission, uh, and we're going to add values and purpose uh, at the end of the semester are important. So um, a vision, they define it as a, a key tool for inspiring people. Just remember it's one of those things that tries to uh, capture in succinct form what the strategy framework is. The following, uh, I'm just going to go through some examples and give, just point out what I think are good and bad. Um, Alcoa, uh, uh, vision statement, pretty general in my view. Uh, the Avon is good because in the statement is a focus on the principal customer, which is women. Uh, Chevron, way too general. How, how can you possibly have a sense of what's going on there. Google uh, is good. Love it. Love it. Very short, crisp, and it's inspiring and stretching for the firm's people to develop a perfect search engine. Um, Kraft Foods, uh, it's okay. It's okay, I, I think, uh, although we can argue that perhaps Oreos aren't exactly uh, eating better. And uh, the, it's curious that the Procter & Gamble example here from the chapter is way too general. I wonder what uh, A.G. Laffley and um, Roger Martin, uh, the authors of Playing to Win, our, our other book that we're reading, would, would think about this, really. A mission statement, um, they define it as who we are. As you'll see later on, I like to define it as what the company is going to accomplish together within a certain time frame. So again, let's take a look at a couple of examples. And I'm going to give you, um, uh, on uh, slide 15, um, uh, here's Harley Davidson. I think it's pretty good, but the notion of superior value in that statement, what do we mean by that? Um, in a couple lectures, we're going to define what value means, both financial value, customer value, a lot of different kinds of value. So it's pretty good, but I think they're using a phrase that might be not known to everybody reading that statement. 
The Internal Revenue Service, even though we don't like them, I certainly don't, uh, is, is okay. It's okay as a mission statement. Um, Starbucks, that statement to me reads more like a vision statement. And by the way, you, you may be noticing it's kind of hard to distinguish in the examples sometimes between a vision or a mission. Just remember, these statements are meant to try to capture in very brief form the essence of the entire strategy framework. Um, the Esther Lauder Company, goodness gracious, way too general. Um, hmm. Limited brands, I think it's pretty good. Captivating customer experiences that drive long-term loyalty and deliver stained growth for our shareholders. Notice they're focusing on the company's economic shareholders. I think that's a good one. Uh, Fender a Musical, uh, even though uh, you know I enjoy playing the drums, uh, I'm a hobbyist musician, uh, this is fairly nebulous. I'm not quite sure if we really understand. The point I wanna, I, I'd like to mention, though, I'm sort of giving you my critique of these statements. These things could mean something to the people inside of the firm if they know how these statements were crafted uh, and there's some context um, behind the statements. But uh, anyway, again, chapter two, we're sort of still getting warmed up uh, in a basic overview of the field. The next session, section starting on, on slide 21, I think is very, very good. Uh, the notion of a SMART goal should find its way, SMART goals and objectives should find its way in every nook and cranny of an organization. So let's take a look, uh, and, and the example the authors give is on Coca-Cola. Uh, so we'll see, it's, so the first letter of the acronym SMART is specific. They want to in, uh, you, uh, improve water efficiency by 20%. By the way, what's behind this goal is, you all may not know, that within as early as 10 to 15 years, parts of even Texas may run out of water. So part of the sustainability movement is to become to be really, really efficient with our uh, resources, our natural resources. So specific, the second uh, letter in SMART is measurable. Um, Want to talk about uh, progress relative to a 20% target. Very good. Uh, aggressive. Uh, as they say, we know from research and I know from experience, we need to set in our goals and objectives just the right amount of stretch. They need to be challenging but attainable. Something that's just not attainable will produce frustration and some degree of cynicism. They need to be realistic. The 20% goal is realistic. A 95% improvement is just not realistic. So uh, realistic and aggressive kind of go hand in hand. Time bound, love this one. They're going to achieve, uh, uh, it, seeking to achieve its 20% 20 uh, 20 improvement by the year 2012. Very, very good to give a time uh, frame uh, for all goals and objectives. So uh, starting with slide 27 then, going from SMART goals and objectives, we want to talk about organizational performance in general. Uh, it is in fact a very multi-dimensional concept. It's vital to strategic management and assist executives whether we know we're on track. And you remember from 1B last week, we said the best measure for the overall measure of performance for the publicly traded firm is total shareholder return and for the private firm not publicly traded it's increases in the value of the firm or the financial valuation of the firm um, so we can have a series of performance metrics and <laughs> you know I'm, I'm an academic but I laugh sometime at some of my colleagues phrases so the performance measure can be around profits, stock price, sales growth you name it uh, a performance referent is a benchmark that we use uh, to, to help us measure. Think of it this way. We take a measure at the current period, what I like to call baseline. So we're going to get a snapshot. Uh, let's say sales growth has been 2% uh, per year in the past. That would be our performance referent or referent. It's the baseline measure. Now, what do we want to get to? We want to go from 2% to 5% annual uh, growth in sales. 
So again, um, you know, we want to use those smart principles behind each of the performance measures uh, that we want to set out, whether it's cash flow, inventory uh, improvement, those kinds of things. Now, the balanced scorecard in slide 29 is uh, the modern form of what we have always called management by objectives. A fellow by the name of George Odeorn in 1965 wrote a, a real famous book um, called Management by Objectives. And th the notion is, is we want to look at performance from the perspective of a group of balanced goals and objectives. And really to understand slide 29, start at number four, which is learning and growth. Uh, they uh, define, you know, the, a good question to ask around those series of objectives would be, can we continue to improve and create value? Those goals and objectives really are at the foundation, even though it's numbered four, is really at the foundation. And it has to do with the people in the company. Do we have the right positions, the right competencies, the right uh, learning opportunities through a corporate university, uh, those kinds of things. And, and so with that as a foundation, then we take a look at our internal business processes and set out a variety of goals. And I think that's a good question. What must we excel at doing? And, and again, those are, are our internal capabilities from how good are we are man at manufacturing, how good are we are at research and development, new product development, sales and marketing. Uh, what are our internal business processes? In turn then, if we do those two well, a series of customer goals and objectives. And the question is, how do customers see us? Uh, so we might want to measure such things as customer, customer loyalty, uh, customer retention, cost to acquire customers, uh, those kinds of things. And then finally, we get to financial objectives. How do we look to shareholders? And uh, if we do the first three groups of, of goals and objectives correctly, we should be able to hit our finance uh, performance goals and objectives. And the last bullet point in that slide is it's a good way, that's why it's called the balanced scorecard, it's a good way to not fixate on only financial measures. So we work on our learning and growth measures first, we then look at bus internal business process measures, customer measures, and finally financial measures. Uh, in a couple lectures, I'm going to have a sort of a picture's worth a thousand words of a balanced scorecard for you. Uh, the triple bottom line is a relatively new view of performance. Uh, kind of like balanced scorecard, it asks companies to be uh, more balanced. Uh, here, it's a real macro view. So instead of only looking at profits, so they have to come up with a little acronym called the three, three P's, uh, where it looks at in, uh, economic concerns, we uh, will want to be concerned with people, not just the people in our organization, but social kinds of concerns as well. And then finally, we want to look at planet, that whole notion of sustaining our natural resources, not polluting. Who knows the reality of global warming, but those kinds of things would come under uh, the planet part of the three Ps. And I, I drew on my, uh, my printout of, of the slide is really a triangle with three points. Profits, in my view, being the most important, but balanced by um, concern and goals for planet and people. Uh, slide um, 31 talks about then, you remember the, this is, the, the title of the chapter is Leading Strategically, so the authors are um, giving a sort of a potpourri of concepts uh, around leading strate strategically. And the notion, it's the notion of the CEO as celebrity. Uh, you can read the advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are uh, a celebrity CEO can be an intangible asset for a company. Later on, we'll call it a strategic resource. For uh, give you an example, Stephen Jobs, who unfortunately has left us, 
uh, was such a celebrity CEO. In fact, even before he got sick with cancer, the board of directors took out a mega multi-million dollar life insurance policy on Stephen Jobs because they knew he basically was Apple. Um, the disadvantages of having a high, highly visible figure is if that person should mess up, uh, the, company, the company's, uh, actually in some cases, valuation, um, total shareholder return valuation can actually fall. Look at Enron um, and other companies who have come under uh, ethics and legal uh, issues. So if you go to slide 32, uh, an interesting matrix of the different types of, of CEOs. Uh, on the bottom axis is CEO repu uh, reputation, low versus high, and CEO fame, low versus high. Well, in the high, high um, uh, quadrant of, of those four cells are what the authors call icons. Uh, the example would be Warren Buffett. Um, in the high fame, low reputation would be those scoundrels. Um, and unfortunately, Kenneth Lay uh, has, has passed away uh, as well, probably from the stress of all of the scandals that Enron get, ended up getting in. Um, silent killers or low reputation and low fame. And, and, and I, I think the, the, the most interesting are hidden gems. An example there is Anne Mulcahy of uh, the CEO of Xerox. They, they have a huge and favorable reputation, but they don't like the limelight, so their, their fame is low. If you're familiar with a, with a book called Good to Great by Jim Collins several years ago, uh, he talked about level five leaders as being uh, one of the criteria is they're very humble. They don't like to grandstand, to showboat, uh, that some other CEOs uh, have done. Okay, so that gets us into slide 33, which I said I think is the most important part of this chapter is, uh, is a discussion of the, uh, the entrepreneurial orientation of an established firm. Why is this important? Well, again, in a few lectures, we'll learn that innovation is a, in the established firm is a hugely important topic and not very many established firms, truthly, truth be known, are good at innovation. So a couple dimensions of EO, or entrepreneurial orientation, autonomy, competitive aggressiveness, innovativeness, proactiveness, and risk-taking, I think are very, very important. And it'd be interesting as you read the chapter and, and look at, at this lecture, think about your orientation as an entrepreneur. By the way, not everybody wants to be or can be an entrepreneur. We have room in, in an organization for all kinds of orientation, but we need to have a good dose of entrepreneurial orientation in any established firm. So let's, let's kind of uh, define them. Autonomy, they define as the tendency to bring forth ideas and see them through to completion. I like to refer to it as uh, the, the person desires freedom in in their day-to-day -day work to be autonomous. Google is famous for giving all of their people 10% of their week free time to work on any project they want to work on. Sure, they can't be personal projects. They have to be aligned with the company's vision, mission, and strategy framework, but there's a tremendous amount of autonomy um, allowed in, in firms like Google. Competitive aggressiveness, yeah, that's just being tough. That is, is uh, uh, having the tenacity to challenge rivals uh, and, and to, be, to be tough. You remember uh, in, in uh, the 1A lecture, I had mentioned that business is really war. Um, slide 36 talks about innovativeness directly and, and how, uh, what is the tendency to pursue novel ideas, creative processes, and experimentation. Um, we need to have not only people that have those personal traits, but a company needs to allow that autonomy and have processes that will allow innovation to come forth. We'll talk about those later. Proactiveness is, is the degree to anticipate and to move first rather than be reactive. 
By the way, there's a fair number of established firms that have set a strategy as to be a close follower to the firms that have more entrepreneurial orientation. Uh, I'm not quite sure in today's world that's a wise thing to do. I think we're, we're getting to the view that every established firm has to have a dose of entrepreneurial orientation in it throughout the organization. Uh, and lastly is risk taking, the tendency to take bold actions rather than being cautious. And I do agree, I think Richard Branson, uh, the chairman uh, and CEO and founder of, of Virgin Corporation, you know, from Virgin Airlines to Virgin Records, a whole host of businesses, um, and Virgin Galactic uh, plans to offer suborbital space flights to uh, commercial passengers kind of a neat idea. I think the price tag, by the way, is, is, from what I hear, is going to be about 10 million a ride. Hmm. Um, so the, again, just the point is many established firms lack this orientation and they need to uh, develop it. Okay, so uh, we've, we've ended, arrived at the end of, of chapter two. Uh, again, kind of filling in our basic material and then chapter or lecture 2B will be a little bit more advanced uh, discussion of leading strategically.